The most common cause of respiratory failure is type 1 respiratory failure or hypoxemic respiratory failure where there is a failure to oxygenate and here you find that the alveolar PO2 is less than 60 millimeters of mercury and this is the most common cause of respiratory failure. While type 2 respiratory failure occurs because of a failure to ventilate leading on to an increase in carbon dioxide to more than 45 to 50 millimeters of mercury. Now, this is not as common as type 1 respiratory failure. Further, both these types can also be divided into acute and chronic depending upon how quickly they develop. Now, it is in hypoxemic respiratory failure, it is difficult to differentiate between an acute, acute or chronic with an ABG alone while you need to look into the clinical features like for example, uh, chronic hypoxemic respiratory failure would have uh, polycythemia or the patient might have uh, uh, clubbing etc. While hypercapnic respiratory failure, type 2 respiratory failure is easier to diagnose with an ABG. For example, in a patient where who is having chronic hyper, uh, hypercapnia which is developed over a period of time or over, uh, over days, you would find that there is some amount of uh, renal compensation and the bicarbonate would be on the higher side. Now, why does the respiratory failure occurs? Why do, what is the pathophysiology uh, that one encounter in these uh, types of failure? Now, the respiratory system has two parts. One is the lungs or the parts which uh, helps in gas diffusion. Other one is the respiratory pump which involves the respiratory controller that is the central nervous system or the respiratory muscles and what connects the central nervous system to the respiratory muscles that is the nervous system. So, problem with any of these parameters either the respiratory controller or the respiratory muscles or what connects these two that is the nervous system can lead on to a pump failure. Most commonly a failure of the lungs leads on to a hypoxemic respiratory failure while failure of the pump leads on to a hypercapnic respiratory failure. It is not that they, they are exclusive, you can have a mix of both, but most commonly a lung failure leads on to failure of the gas exchange and that affects oxygenation more, while a pump failure leads on to decrease in uh, alveolar ventilation and that leads on to hypercapnia more than hypoxia. Now, let us look into in detail of the hypoxemic respiratory failure. Ultimately, what matters is the amount of oxygen that is delivered into the tissues and the amount of oxygen that is available at the mitochondrial level to ensure aerobic metabolism. So, what determines this? The oxygen delivery is nothing but a function of arterial oxygen content and cardiac output. Cardiac output as you all know depends upon the stroke volume and heart rate and stroke volume in, ad in addition depends upon preload, afterload and contractility. We will not look into this aspect of the oxygen delivery. We will concentrate on the arterial oxygen content. Now, as you all know, arterial oxygen content depends upon the oxygen saturation, the amount of hemoglobin that is available and the PO2. Now, we cannot change either either this or this because that is fixed the amount of oxygen that is carried by 1 gram of hemoglobin is 1.39 ml and that is fixed in amount of, amount of oxygen that can be in solution is also fixed. What we can change is the saturation, the amount of hemoglobin that is available and the PO2. These are the factors that we as clinicians can change to increase the arterial oxygen content. So, let us look into PO2. What are the factors that affects PO2?